Welcome to the Future in 15 show. I'm host Caleb Parker. If you're tuning in for the first time, the Future in 15 show is 15 minute interviews with entrepreneurs and business leaders who are innovating within their company and creating the future of their industry. Welcome to the Future in 15 show. Today we are in the great city of Manchester, England at the HBA's annual forum hosted by Mercure Piccadilly. We have Chris Elmet, the MD of Crystal Interactive Meetings with us today. I'm really excited to talk about event app technology. Chris, welcome. Thank you. All right. So um, obviously the audience today has experienced Crystal Interactive, uh, but for those people watching who may not know, can you give us a quick summary of what you guys do? Yeah, of course. So Crystal Interactive Meetings is uh, the largest UK event technology provider. Uh, that means we turn up at a lot of shows all over the country and indeed the world, and we provide three things. So first of all, we source the best-in-class technology uh, to deploy in live events. So that's the first part. The second thing is that we put the team on site to make it actually work, because we believe that you need to have a team to make technology work. It doesn't manage itself. And the third thing is that we uh, provide advice uh, for people who are trying to make the most effective use of technology. And that's generally in the run-up to the event. Very good. So I, I've, I've got loads of questions here. Mm -hmm. I hope we have time to get through them all. Um, today, obviously, we're using uh, an app provided by Crystal Interactive. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the questions that, that my agency, we have, mm -hmm. and, and I speak to agents all the time, one of the biggest questions is, every day we turn around, it seems like there's loads of event app companies out there. Um, how do we as agents cut through the noise and find the right solution for our clients? Yeah, that's a really good, uh, really good question. And there are a lot of event app providers. I think there were 145 at the last count, which I think was in, uh, around Christmas time. Uh, 145? Yeah, that's 145 around the world. But uh, you can expect to come uh, across all of them if you look hard enough. And you guys are number one? We're number one. Uh, what's your rankings? Whatever your rankings are, we'll work it out that we're okay. number one. But, uh, yeah, so there's 145, and, and look, as an agency, it's not very easy because uh, all of these different companies are getting in touch with you at different times. They all focus on their particular strengths, uh, and it can be confusing to work out which one is the best fit for your client. But if I think about the agencies that I know who are doing things best, the first thing that they've done is they've worked out where they want to play. And what that means is you need to work out as an agency. Do you want to be a middleman and an introducer, or do you want to be a value-added reseller? So either you're the one who keeps your ear to the ground, finds out good technology, and introduces that straight through to the client, in which case my advice is be completely transparent about that, or you develop a set of capabilities around bringing that app to your client. That means you might have processes to do with security, with project management, with content uploading, with on-site deployment. And there are agencies that are doing that, but the ones that do it best are the ones that fix on a couple of providers and they practice and they develop their skills. They don't just pretend to have those skills. So that's the first thing that you can do to cut through. Uh, the second thing is I think uh, it's really important for an agency who knows their clients better than anyone else to make sure that they are matching the right technology with their clients. And that doesn't just mean in terms of features. So if I can give you one brief example, uh, I was party to a conversation uh, the other day where an agency introduced to one of the five largest five pharmaceutical companies in the world an app provider that had no security policy and no full-time employees. Now, those two things are not what that pharmaceutical company were looking for. Mm. So you've got to match up to the level of quality and cost that your, uh, your client is looking for. You've got to match up and find the right supplier. Thank you. Um, so speaking of clients, mm -hmm. is there a problem that event organizers aren't solving today that an app can solve? Yeah, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of them, and the really boring answer, I suppose, is to say, well, it depends what your objectives for your event are, and then 
find the way that the app can help you achieve your objectives. But that's the really boring answer, so don't count that one. Uh, what I think that you can do is you can take something like an event where the focus is on learning. Okay, so you're bringing people together, you're teaching them something, and when you've got them there, you can use the app to quantify how much they've actually learned. Okay, everyone sits in the audience, they look like they're learning, but what are they actually taking in as a result of these presentations they're watching? You haven't got a very easy way to do that unless you use technology like event apps, but if you use your event app to evaluate how much people have learned, you get a much bit better sense of whether that event has delivered. So how do you do that? Can you dive in deeper to that? How yeah, so, so I mean, the, the very simplest way that we do that is we run uh, voting at the end of sessions or sections in an agenda, and we literally test the audience on what they have retained. And that can be a straight fact. Can you remember this acronym for kind of lower level uh, groups? And then for more senior groups, you might ask more searching questions. So not just the answer that the speaker gave on stage, but ask people to think through how that would have implications in their day-to-day -day business. Again, through doing polling uh, in it, through the app and to quantify what people are getting out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Um, today, mm -hmm. we've, we've, we talked earlier, um, but before we came on stage here, about the engagement that we had. And, and I know a lot of the clients that I talk to, they want to increase engagement at mm -hmm. their event. Mm -hmm. So how can an event app increase engagement, and, and how, do, how do we do today? Yeah, so today I think is a really good test. For me, uh, event app, uh, events fall into two categories. Uh, in one category, you have uh, up to half the people using the event app, and that is where the event app is something that is for convenience. It doesn't structurally change the event. It doesn't uh, uh, in great, uh, have great impact on the objectives of the event. It's a convenience thing that if you want to use, you can use. And for those events, looking at 50% utilization is absolutely fine. There are other events sorry, where... Sorry, 50%? Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Because if we take an example, uh, if we have an event app and it's got an agenda in it, okay, some people might download the event app to look at the agenda. But other people might say, do you know what, I haven't got that much space on my phone, I don't really get on with the Wi-Fi here, and therefore I'm just going to ask the desk, which is what I did last year. So for those sorts of events, 50% may not be that surprising. There are other events where the, the app is being used uh, as, a, as a more central part of the meeting. So for instance, the app is the very best way for people to be able to identify other people with whom they can network at the meeting. And that's actually an objective of the meeting. We want people to make connections and find new solutions together, for instance. And in those, it only works if you have 100% utilization. So uh, we see apps falling in two camps. The ones where it's a kind of optional extra and the one where it's central. And for those ones, if you're looking to increase engagement, the first thing that you have to do is you have to remove the barriers. So make it easy for people to connect. All sorts of little detailed things like if the venue that you go into has a splash page on its Wi-Fi, so you connect to the Wi-Fi and then it pops up a splash page and says, give me your details, that's going to dissuade people from using the Wi-Fi and it's going to dissuade people from using the apps. So there's 50 things probably like that, quite small detail things that are barriers to people using the app. Another thing which, um, uh, which helps with engagement is starting early. So make sure that people can get hold of that app with enough time in advance so that they can start to use it before they arrive. Well, how did we do that for this event? Yeah, so we did really well on this event. We got uh, 133 downloads out of a population of 266. 266 is everyone, everyone who could possibly be using this app, not just the people here, before yesterday. Okay, so 50% had downloaded before yesterday, and now we're running at about 79, 80%. So another 30% have uh, downloaded the app in the time between yesterday and now. And that is, I would say, for an event like this, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good uptake rate. So I want to go back to, you mentioned Wi-Fi earlier. Mm. Is, is Wi-Fi required to have an app? Because, I mean, we have data on our, on our mobile phones, so why do yeah. we need Wi-Fi? Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. Uh, the venue that we're at today, it's actually got very good signal. We're in central Manchester with three floors up, giant windows, lots of 4G coming in the room. Uh, to be honest, if you've got enough data, you don't really need to go on the Wi-Fi. But if you're three floors down and you've got absolutely no signal, then you must, must have Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi is the single biggest stress point for event organizers when it comes to delivering event apps. Everyone's got a SCAR, 
everyone's got a story. Mm. I'm sure you have a lot of war stories. Every here. single one of those gray hairs, Caleb. That's, yeah. a, that's a Wi-Fi. It's all Wi-Fi. Yeah, that's all Wi-Fi. All right. So we talked about increasing engagement. Mm. What, what are some strategies to, to drive that engagement, to encourage networking? What can organizers do to make that happen? Yeah, so if we take uh, networking as an example, uh, almost every event app that you use will have a profile. So people can put in their name, their job title, you know, and that's usually as far as it goes. But if you're looking at networking, you can take it a, much, a, a level much higher than that. So if you're, uh, if you're trying to foster networking, for instance, you could get people to think carefully about the biography that they put into the app. Don't put your CV in, because that's really boring. Don't put the thing that's on the website, because that was written four years ago and it's out of date. Actually, as you sit here today, the 50 words that describe who you are as a person coming to this event actually make human beings out of the list of people in the delegate list. If you invest some time in doing that, other people are going to find points of interest with you, and it's going to stimulate the networking. Now, that's nothing to do with the way the software works. That's the way that the event organizer exploits that that software and actually makes connections between human beings. Good. Okay. Funny question for you. <laughs> when should an event not have an app? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. And, and for me, uh, there's a lot of events. In fact, I would guess that more than half of all events actually don't really need an app. I was expecting you to say none. All yeah, well, none, no, no, sorry. Yeah, that's what my sales manager would tell me to say. But, uh, but I, it's, it's actually... Uh, more than half, uh, half of the... 50% uh, 50, 50 should yeah, not have an app. Why? Yeah, I would say so. so. So first of all, there's a lot of events that are short. If they're four hours or less, it's quite an overhead to get people to download an app, learn how to use it, get some value from it, and then discard it afterwards all in four hours. That's kind of... Most apps don't get downloaded for four hours. They get downloaded for longer. So very short meetings is one. The second one is if you're thinking about an event app and you're thinking, okay, so I'll have the agenda on there... And then, and then, and if you can't actually add anything to the list, then my suggestion would be send them the agenda by email and at the bottom of it say think before you print mm. and you've ticked both boxes. You've done an electronic communication, you've not used paper and you've given them the agenda in a, in a convenient format. So if there isn't a real need uh, beyond what you can do through other means, then, uh, th then I would say steer clear and save it for the times when it's going to have real impact. Because one of the things I think that we've suffered from in this industry is everyone has used so many event apps, you know, there's, there's no excitement about them anymore. Like, I mean, how many event apps have you used, Caleb, in the last five years, would you say? 50, 100? Well, I wouldn't say it's that high, but uh, probably, probably 15 or 20 at least. Okay, yeah. there you go. Yeah. 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 So, Chris, what's the most unusual or innovative use of an app that you've seen? You have loads of data, I'm sure. Yeah, so, so a lot of the apps that we use are used in the way that we're using ours today. So there's a little bit of interactivity in there. We're using it for Q&A. We're using it for some paperless content. Those are all the sort of, we do a lot of those sorts of events, and, and that's an appropriate use of technology. But there was one event that really, really got me excited, and it was a roadshow that we did for a financial services client. Now, they were going around the regions meeting all their IFAs, their independent financial advisors, and they were updating them on all of the products that they had to sell uh, in the year ahead. And this was a big gig for them. This was like over 50% of their marketing to their IFAs went on this roadshow. So uh, they went around the, the, the regions. In the morning, there was a set piece from the CEO. There was a Q&A uh, that the IFAs participated in. And then there was a big exhibition where they really went to town. They had their nine product sets, and every single one of them had a fabulous exhibition stand. The, the, all of the delegates had an iPad provided by us, and they were using a piece of technology called iBeacons which basically allowed them to come up to a stand, they would tap into the stand like you do with your Oyster card, and the, the iPad would then show them a piece of information. It said, you're at the XYZ stand, would you like to have this brochure sent to your email? So far, so simple, a, gen a, a simple use of iBeacons. When Bob came up to the stand and checked in, the stand holder on their iPad got a form, and the form said, this is Bob. And this is what we know about Bob. Here's how many products he bought last year. Here's his biggest customer. And here's the things he's told us he's interested in. Everything that company could pull out of their sales force was available on that form. And there were two simple questions at the bottom of the form which the standholder would fill in in order to update what this company knew about that IFA. So this went on for nine events, and they got a ton of data, and we analyzed the data. And what we found was that some stands were busier than others, as you'd expect. 
but even with the busy stands, there were some who completed no forms and others who completed every single form for every single visitor they got. Now, what that says to me is there are two very differently performing salespeople on each of those stands. And I thought, finally, I've got some data from an event which I can make available to a client, which is actually going to make a difference to their bottom line. So I emailed my client and I said, uh, would you like to know which the best performing stand holders are according to this criteria, the ones who filled in the forms? And the, it, the reply I got back was, why would, you be, why would you be darkening my door with this data? I, I organize events. And that kind of drew me, made me feel absolutely crazy because I thought, hang on, we've got a way of connecting an event to business performance, but you don't want it. You don't want that data. So there you go. That was the most unusual experience that I had. It's a bit, a bit peculiar. Mm. Did you ed educate that client? Uh, I, I educated that client by describing them in unpleasant terms at the to wall your, of my your, office. To your staff? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You want to say who that client was? No. Okay. <laughs> Surprisingly. Yeah. Um, okay. So do we need, for, for an organization who has multiple events throughout the year, mm -hmm. is it best to have one app for all events or have a different event for each event? Different, for, different app for, for each event. Yeah, okay. So this is something that a lot of clients wrestle with. So generally, the decision about whether to have one app for all events or an app per event really needs to sit with the end client, okay? Because the end client has a program of events and any one agency may do a proportion of those but is unlikely to do all of them. So that is a conversation that needs to happen between the end client and the app provider. And clearly that is awkward, okay? Because the agency has a relationship, but it might be a conversation that needs to happen between app provider and end client. So uh, that, that aside, generally for a client, the advice would be if you're doing a lot of events, create one app that you put on the app store, and anyone who comes to your events only downloads that one app, okay? So it's one app that needs going through approval, they download that app, and then when they go to a particular meeting, they effectively download a page in the app for that meeting. That's the best way to do it. It's the simplest way, it's the cheapest way, but you've got to have a client who can see enough events to make that investment up front, and often the biggest challenge is who pays for that investment up front? Is it the holder of the, the budget for the first meeting, or is it the events team, but they don't have any budget? You know, who pays for that, that container, as it's called? So, Chris, uh, how can people find you? On Twitter? Yeah, they can find me on Twitter, at Chris Elmitz. I've been uh, tweeting today, good fun, mostly with you, Caleb. Oh, you know. In your website? <laughs> uh, CIMeetings.com. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. Great, thank you. Cheers. Cheers.